This is the Saber Coach Kate podcast, where I highlight the great thinkers, athletes, and coaches in the dynamic sport of Olympic fencing. Keith Smart is a saber fencer who achieved a lot of success on the fencing strip. He qualified for three Olympics, placing 30th in 2000, 15th in individual and 4th in the team event in 2004, and 6th in individual in 2008. He also won the silver medal in the team event that year after serving as the anchor. In 2002 and 2004, Keith won the U.S. National Sabre Championship. Perhaps greatest of all, in 2003, he became the first American to be named the top-ranked fencer internationally. He was elected to the USA Fencing Hall of Fame in 2014. You can still find Keith involved in our sport. He coaches at the Peter Westbrook Foundation and serves on their board, but he's also involved in the world of business. After an internship at Google, several managerial positions at Verizon and Bank of America, Keith decided to start his own business, Physiclo, in 2014. He and his team created and now produce high quality compression gear with built-in resistance for a more productive workout. Physiclo has received great reviews from publications such as Men's Health, The Gloss and Engadget, as well as rave reviews from athletes of many kinds of sport. You can check out the gear on their website, www.physiclo.com, on Instagram and also on Facebook. Listen now to the interview I did with Keith Smart, fencer and businessman extraordinaire. Also, a super nice guy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Saber Coach Kate podcast. My guest this evening is Olympian Keith Smart. Keith, I am so excited to have you on this show. Thank you so much for agreeing to do an interview with me. Oh, thank you. The pleasure's all mine. I'm really excited to chat fencing and everything else. <laughs> Well, how did you even become a fencer? Because I know you did other sports in school. So what's the story with that? Sure. Um, so I uh, started fencing through the Peter Westbrook Foundation. Um, and and how I discovered the Peter Westbrook, Peter Westbrook Foundation was my dad used to work at Sports Illustrated. And he suggested that uh, my sister and I, I have a younger sister, Erin, uh, try and do fencing versus any of the other sports we were doing at the time because he had read that uh, fencing has the best odds at getting a kid a college scholarship. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> scholarship angle. The college scholarship, yeah. And so um, at the time, um, I was playing a lot of basketball and tennis, and uh, Aaron was doing a lot of tennis and track and field. So uh, uh, it just kind of we lucked out in being one of the first two kids to join the Peter Westwood Foundation, and the rest was history. <laughs> Wow, the first two kids? I had no idea that you, I mean, I knew that you were part of the early days of the foundation, but I didn't realize you were, like, the first students. That's right, yeah. Um, We were the uh, inaugural class, uh, and I say that lightly, where it was only, like, eight eight or so kids initially, and then the next year it grew to, like, 20, and then, uh, like, it was doubling every year until we reached capacity at like 150. Wow, wow, that's amazing. Well, what was it besides the scholarship opportunities that appealed to you about fencing? Uh, So there was a few things for me personally. Uh, I was a big fan of like Star Wars and uh, the whole lightsaber thing. So um, that really was interesting. That's kind of like what my parents sold me on initially. The other thing that I liked a lot was the fact that fencing... um, your success was dictated by how much hard work you put into it. It wasn't like one of those sports like uh, basketball or baseball where you had like other teammates who might or might not practice as hard. Um, And then uh, I also liked the challenge, like just the mental challenge of like every, every practice there was something new to learn, there was something new to like analyze and, uh, you know, constantly like uh, thinking about, oh man, how do I, do this better, or how do I uh, beat this person? Uh, 
just ended up being like this ultimate Rubik's cube for me. <laughs> That's a really interesting way of putting it. I've never heard anyone describe fencing that way before. <laughs> I'm, I'm one for analogy, so uh, be, be careful. <laughs> well, you always hear about people calling it physical chess. But the mm -hmm. Rubik's cube, that's, yeah, that's an interesting metaphor. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's one of those things where, like, I don't think anybody ever truly solves that uh, Rubik's cube. Like, uh, regardless of how good of a fencer you can become, um, there's always something you can improve upon. So it's just like, wow. You know, like, yeah, you can end up, like, a fall, falling, like, just constantly, like, improving and improving, but... Uh, you know, always tweaking something else. So it's <laughs> yeah, I just attended Coach's College last week, and that's how I felt when I was there because you know that you've learned things, but then this whole world just is opened up to you, and there's just so much more that there is to learn. Exactly, yeah, and, and, and you never stop learning. Uh, you know, even now I'm... I constantly watch uh, top fencers, and although I'm not competing, I'm still like taking um, a lot of the moves that they do uh, when I apply it to practice. Because I'm like, oh, that seems cool. Let me try try that next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, you're a saber fencer, uh, and people say that the weapon chooses the fencer. So, what was it about saber that appealed to you? <laughs> well, that's a very generous in my situation. <laughs> it was more um, uh, um, uh, my uh, sister beating me in fall forced me into saber. <laughs> I, um, I so I started out in foil uh, my first two years, and I I just wasn't nowhere near as good as Erin. Uh, she just had all the coordination and the talent for a really good fencer and um, my coach or our coach at the time um, Alvaro Kogler happened to just coach three weapons and he was like alright so you know you should uh, uh, try Sabre because foil just is not for you and uh, and um, yeah so I I, um, I went into Sabre and uh, you know it, it just so happened that I, like with my speed and height and everything else it kind of the stars somewhat aligned. <laughs> and you could get away from your sister. That's right. Yeah, that was the most important thing for my parents. Uh, and for me personally, like, it was just embarrassing losing to uh, my sister every practice. <laughs> well, actually, I was going to ask you about your relationship at the club, if you were competitive or, you know, kind of laid back. But I, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we, we were really competitive. And I think, uh, you know, the coaches, um, they were cognizant of that. And they're like, you guys need to do different weapons. And, uh, you know, and then, but we always trained together. Um, like, she was my number one footwork partner. Um, uh, and um, so it helped my footwork grow exponentially. Even until, like, the last day I, I competed, I would always uh, train with her and doing, like, like, footwork drills and distance drills just because of um, the way she moved and the rhythm she had. But uh, we also made it very competitive whenever we would do those drills. So well, okay. <laughs> never a dumb moment. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good to have someone that pushes you like that. Yes, indeed. And, um, and uh, you know, I think we pushed each other. Um, and, uh, and then there's also obviously other members of uh, the Fences Club, Peter Westwick Foundation that also like pushed me like on the strip and stuff. But uh, everyone was the first one that kind of got it started. <laughs> uh, you've mentioned the Peter Westbrook Foundation several times. So tell me about what it was like to be a part of that initial group. And, you know, how did you like, did you ever know that it was going to become what we see it has become today? <laughs> uh, so those early years, it started in 1991, and uh, the early years were pretty bleak and uh, dire, quite frankly. Uh, we, we, we were using all hand-me-down equipment, and uh, we were, um, you know, the, the club that we trained at, the Fences Club, uh, uh, it, was, it was relatively small. It only had three strips, and... Uh, so you, if you think about it, three strips for three weapons, uh, <laughs> it, 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 there wasn't a lot of space. So uh, 
for like the first few years we would fence on like half strips and uh wow you know and we did a lot of like target practice because there just wasn't any space so uh, no one really envisioned it would be as big as it is now um i think like doing like we like I remember this distinctly. The first few years, probably like four years, we mostly did drills because there just wasn't enough space to do actual bouting. Um, but we made the drills really fun and entertaining, you know, like hitting target, doing footwork, stuff like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess we didn't realize it could be big until like the late 90s when we started placing members on the junior team. Yeah. Well, and now uh, I talked. Well, I talked with Kamali in a previous interview, and she said that like 200 kids show up for practice on Saturdays. What is it like for you to enter that room and have all that energy in one place like that? <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's exciting. Uh, you know, like we have like anywhere between 150 to 200 kids every Saturday um, from 8 to 18 years old. And uh, what's exciting, they're coming from all over the city, some as far away as Pennsylvania. So, yeah, like, seeing all these kids that just really want to use fencing as a tool to better their, their lives. Uh, and um, I'm, I love it because, um, you know, I started out as a student like them and then uh, graduating to be a mentor to now being one of the volunteer coaches. And, like, just seeing, like, how hungry um, the kids are to learn about fencing and to grow is, uh, it's been very rewarding and fulfilling. And, uh, you know, like, they all, all the kids, um, they, they end up becoming a part of this, uh, not a fraternity, but like this extended family. So we'll have uh, people that were members five years ago, 10 years ago, and they'll come back and it's like a just this warm reunion. <laughs> How long of a break did you take? Uh, between when you retired and then when you started coaching there? Oh, I, I, I didn't take a break at all, actually. Okay. I, uh, I, um, I actually went into coaching at the foundation, geez, uh, while I was competing, probably like between my first and second Olympics, uh, I really started getting involved. And uh, like my specialty here is... Um, I, I do, like, all the warm-up classes, mm -hmm. so, like, doing, like, the actual calisthenics and uh, footwork and stuff like that, so, and then I'll lead the advanced saber class, uh, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I started doing that basically when I was, like, around, like, 2003, and, uh, and I wanted to, like, kind of, like, uh, take a lot of the best practices that I saw in Europe, uh, the kids' classes that I was witnessing in Europe and bring them to the foundation hmm. and a lot of a lot of the other guys uh, did the same thing so um, the way the foundation is structured now and run now is very different from when I began yeah I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> many lessons learned literally over the years exactly <laughs> well tell me more about your fencing career and what you consider to be your greatest fencing accomplishment oh uh I guess uh, the easy answer for the greatest fence and accomplishment would be winning the Olympic medal uh, in Beijing. Yeah, that, that might be kind of a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but um, I, I guess, um, like, uh, you know, that, that definitely is one of, like, the highlights of my career. By far, it's, like, the biggest highlight of my career. Um, it's what most people know me for. Uh, and I'm very proud of it because uh, it was a long and ar arduous path. Um, uh, in addition, I would say, like, some of the key highlights that I'm most proud of are uh, being the first American to be ranked number one in the world. Yeah. And uh, and then um, prior to that, I guess I would say, like, when I um, first won NCAAs as a freshman. Uh, now you see it all the time, more or less. But uh, when, it, when I did it, like, back in 1997, it was unheard of. Yeah. <laughs> Well, also because Sabre wasn't a really big deal back then. And so for That's somebody funny. to launch onto the scene, onto the college scene like that, and then take it all home, yeah, that's a really big deal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, describe a typical training day for you as an athlete. Yeah, uh, so it, it really, um, 
like typically how I how I would train was um, at practice. Uh, I would add about uh, three to four times a week. And, though, and how it would start is uh, I'd start off the practice with doing 30 minutes of footwork and then followed by a 30-minute private lesson. And uh, I might uh, do like 30 minutes of drills, but I typically prefer to do uh, free fencing. Uh, when I was younger, I would do the drills, uh, the group drill classes. But once I started uh, essentially staying on the World Cup tour, I would, I would do more uh, free fencing. Uh, and, and in that, I, was, I would spend about 30 minutes without taking a break of just doing straight free fencing and applying the lessons that I learned from, the ba from um, my private lesson. So if we were working on a defensive action, I will just work on that uh, with the guys and girls uh, in free fencing. And then uh, I usually um, would fence like, like about four or five touch bouts and then the rest would be 15 touches, four or five touches. So I, I, every practice, um, I would like to replicate a tournament. So like doing like four to five, five touches and then like, you know, at least five to six, 15 touches, if not more, depending on how I felt. And all of that I could accomplish within three hours. Mm -hmm. Well, and how did you structure those, those uh, practice pool bouts? I mean, did you seek out particular opponents or was it just pretty much whoever was around? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Kate. So, um, for me personally, I always believed in fencing whoever was around. Um, uh, that was because of my experience as a kid uh, fencing at the Fences Club, and like they would have like it was a limited amount of space, so like the kids wouldn't be allowed to fence with the adults and vice versa. So uh, I uh, when once I got older, I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'll just fence anyone, and because I, you never know who you're gonna draw at the tournament. So if I can beat like a kid. Uh, you know, I'm not going to use, like, my best action on them. I'm going to, like, try and work on my weakness. And uh, and I still do that today. Uh, and then uh, same thing with an adult. Like, you know, once I figured out what touches worked and which touches I could go to, I'm not going to, like, continue to pound away on those touches. Instead, I always was cognizant to work on my weaknesses to, like, hopefully turn them into, like, close to, close to being strengths. But, uh... I, I think um, most people know me, um, at least in the New York City area, as a fencing anyone. Um, that's just who I am. I, I like to fence everyone. I, I, I can learn from everyone in fencing. <laughs> well, that's a really good attitude to take, uh, like you said, because you never know who you're going to see at a tournament. But it also encourages the next generation of fencers, and it helps them have a good attitude, too. Exactly, and, and and that's something like I was very fortunate. Like when I was growing up, like Peter Westbrook, he would fend, he was training with me when I was like I didn't deserve to fence bouts with him, and uh, he was like training for the Olympics and as well as like Nick Ailes and co and Steve Momando. So um, once I got to their age, not their age, I'm still younger than them when we were competing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, once I get, once I got older, um, I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna fence with everyone. And you know, obviously, um, at times, you know, like my coach Yuri, he would hold um, practices just for like the elite level. And then, I'm, you know, there's nothing I can do in that situation. But um, if if anybody was um, at the club and wanted to fence me, and still to this day, if anybody wants to fence me, I'll fence everyone because uh, it's fun and. Um, you know, I get something out of it, and, and I think they get something out of it as well. Well, and it goes to show you as well that you don't necessarily have to always be surrounded by elite athletes in order to attain the highest level in our sport. <laughs> <laughs> Those little but, kids can help too. <laughs> but, well, and it's funny you say that. That's exactly right. Um, when I when I was ranked number one in the world, uh, a lot of the Euro European guys were kind of like, struggling to understand how I did it and I was like because they would come to the fences club and they were expecting like this elite training center and it was just like me fencing with like random kids <laughs> 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 with a real fencer thrown in right. somewhere and right. yeah I'm, I'm doing footwork with my sister and they're like what the hell <laughs> 
that, Europe. Take that. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not a who you practice with, it's how you value practice. Right? Precisely. Precisely. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Well, uh, you've mentioned your coaches a couple of times. Uh, can you talk to me about them and the particular things that you you learned from them? Yeah. Um, so I've been blessed where I've had two amazing personal coaches and Aura Kogler and Yuri Gelman. Aura worked with me for the first half of my career um, from like 1991 to the 2000, uh, exactly. <laughs> And, um, and he, you know, he just was really big in, uh, technique and the fundamentals and, you know, like really instilling in me the discipline to practice technical footwork and mental training and visualization and, and all of those like positive thinking exercises that I still apply to this day. Um, like, like he would instill rules of like, you had to hit a spot, the same spot on the wall, like a hundred times in a row. And if you miss, start all over again, stuff wow. like that. Wow. Yeah. Like one summer, he and I, every lesson, I just did jump lunge. That was it. Mm. Hitting his head the whole <laughs> summer, just jump lunge, no other action. So like, it was just like, until it was perfect, he didn't want to move on. Wow. Um, which was good for me, you know. And then Yuri, when I, and, Yuri, and Alva was the one that switched me from, thrill to saber so I owe a lot of credit to him for doing that but um when I when I switched to Yuri um I, he was he was just a godsend for me um because he um he also believed in technique but um uh, he really emphasized tactics something that I hadn't used um like if if um like if you watch me fence in the 2000 Olympics and stuff like that I was just using like athletic ability and technique but as I, what really made the leap for me was um, the tactical uh, applications of, uh, you know, m- learning that whole circle of fencing of like, when somebody makes a parent, then you do fin attack. When they do fin attack, you do counter attack. When you do counter attack, you do, you know, <laughs> straight cut and all this stuff. So it, it was, um, it was like really just like I, I was a sponge for all this knowledge and. He and I spent lots and lots of time just talking about how to beat different schools of fencing, beat different types of fencers, how to like approach every every bout differently, like what people like to do, and then like making what like I said earlier, like the practice is really challenging. So if I was gonna fence like you know a kid that just started fencing, it doesn't make sense for me to plunge like try and like work on point in line or something like that so and or like for me like my biggest weakness is doing para repos like having me to like work on para repos like you know um because technically i could probably make anybody in the world fall short but i hate like taking the blade so he would always uh, uh have me work on those actions which was great because um you know he was just really always thinking about okay keith how do we get to number one in the world how do we get to number one in the world that's all he would think about Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then some random kid that was supposed to just attack you so that you could parry would actually get touches on you and feel like amazing (laughs) exactly exactly (laughs) the dolls of the world (laughs) Um, i'm really curious who was it that taught you to flunge because, I mean, that's, that's your move, you know? That's, that's your thing. <laughs> well, I, I can't take full credit. Uh, I, I stole it from Ivan, Ivan Lee, my, my buddy and teammate and brother, quite mm-hmm. frankly. Um, you know, we grew up together. Um, we literally have, we grew up in the same neighborhood and went to the same high school and same college. And um, I was watching him fence, and he was, like, destroying people with it. And I was like... You know, you gotta teach me how to do this move. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he he, you know, he taught me, and uh, and Yuri Yuri had taught Ivan, and uh, and then uh, I I just like ran with it. You know, I think I took it a little bit further than they did. <laughs> but it, it was definitely Ivan who started it, and then um, you know, I just kind of built on that foundation, and uh, it was great um, because. Uh, you know, with my, because uh, I had played so much basketball as a kid, um, being able to dunk and all that stuff since high school, I could really uh, 
jump pretty far. And so playing the flange with, uh, you know, uh, before Ivan and I did it, no one used to do it ever. And now you see it all over. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Like, um, it's a move now that uh, everybody's kind of adopted and it. it started in the fences club. <laughs> Yeah, and it's even moved on to the women's game, too. Uh, there's mm -hmm. not always a lot of similarity between the two genders' games, but I do see the women doing that more often, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, like, uh, quite like Doug Mara flunges all the time. Uh -huh. She's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, and, and if the kids will really flunge, too, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I, I, I watch a lot of women see their fencing as well. I'm a fan of the whole sport. Well, I remember watching you flunge off the line one time and hit somebody, and I was just like, how do people do this, you know? <laughs> now I understand. That's all that basketball training. There you go. I, I... <laughs> well, if that's all I got to do, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a secret. I play, play a lot of basketball, and then uh, flunging becomes relatively easy. <laughs> all right. What were you like as a fencer when you were competing? Uh, I, I think, um, you know, people would know me as a competitor, like, I competed really hard. You know, I, I had to learn to mature, like, um, initially I, I took every loss personal, and I was like, oh my god, it's the end of the world, and, but um, what, what I was known for, especially in Europe, um, as somebody in really good shape and like somebody that competed really hard. So what that meant specifically was I could move up and down the strip, you know, like 10, five times, whatever, and I'm not going to get tired. Um, so, and I actually prefer that because I knew like a lot of guys just weren't in the same physical shape. And, you know, because I'm not as strong physically, uh, like I don't parry a lot or stuff like that. So like I really just it was mostly I was known for footwork Like just moving up and down up and down and then hitting somebody with a plunge Because uh, I because uh, I, I really never liked to parry. Um, I accepted my fate years ago uh, <laughs> So I was just like all right, we're gonna move and you're gonna move a lot and you're gonna get really tired um, the other thing was um, I was known for somebody that wasn't afraid to go back um, so, um, but a lot of people don't like to go back. And in fact, if you look at any of my tapes, I really go simultaneous. Um, it's just, I had broken my wrist a bunch when I was like younger fencing because I'm not that big. So after you break your wrist a couple of times, it's like, all right, going simultaneous doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I. I rarely ever go simultaneous. Uh, I'll pretend to go simultaneous, and if I see they hesitate, then I'll flunge. Or if I see that they're about to come at me for like a simultaneous action, then I'll just go backwards because I, I'm confident that like I could retreat faster than most people can attack. Hmm. I think it's really interesting that somebody who doesn't feel confident about his parry would feel perfectly comfortable and confident going backwards anyway. That's that's a really cool dichotomy. <laughs> well, I, I would say this, like, and Peter Westwood will always comments about this. I, um, I, I have a weird counterattack timing. So because I'm running, uh, it looks like I'm running away. I'm really not. I'm, like, my hand is always out there. So I'm, I'm basically pretending to hit you with a counterattack. And so once I feel that break in tempo, then I'll take over. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was, uh, like I said earlier, like I used to do all these like footwork drills with Aaron and like, and also with a couple of the FA fencers, um, and, as well as with Ivan. So we would just practice trying to find different rhythms of chasing people up and down the strip. Mm -hmm. And any break in the tempo, I would, I, I just trained myself to take over the attack right away. Mm -hmm. What's the best advice you received as a fencer, either from a coach or for some from someone else? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I, th I think the best advice I've received was like you know, it, you, you always have to work. There's always somebody working harder than you, so you gotta keep continue to work hard and don't get frustrated. Um, you know, this is a uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint, essentially. Hmm. So like a lot of a lot of the times. You know, you might have a goal to whatever, 
do well at a tournament, make a team or something like that. And uh, it doesn't work out at that very moment. But that should be a building block for the next season or the next event versus like looking at it as a world is over. Um, you know, I, I found that to be really, really beneficial for me is like just like, and, and then the other thing is, um, <clears throat> I would say this, it's from a, a good friend of uh, my teammate uh, in foil, Cliff Bayer, uh, Olympic four friends, and he was like, you know, Keith, uh, everybody in the world can be beat. Don't act like uh, someone, someone's more special than you. Uh, and, I, and it really resonated with me because, you know, in the late 90s, um, when I first started going to Europe, a lot of Americans had this defeatist attitude of like, oh my God, we're not going to beat the Euros and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Cliffy was like, hey man, everybody can be beat. And on any given day, you can be beat the best person in the world and they can beat you. So you just got to go out there and fight for every touch. And that was something that I really took to heart. Well, and it took you to number one in the world, like you mentioned before. So you, you said that in 2003, you became the first American to be named number one in the world internationally. So tell me what you felt that moment that you found out. Um, well, when I found out, I, I'll, I'll never forget where I found out. Um, I was in Athens, uh, Greece, uh, and uh, <laughs> Tim Morehouse uh, we were, we were like, we were, we were waiting for a flight, a layover, like spending the night. And he uh, knocked on my hotel room door and he was like, Keith, it's official, you're number one. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, I had been like top three for most of the season or whatever. And uh, he was like, man, you did it, blah, blah, blah. And um, for me, it was more of um, like a validation in like, my teammates and my coaches and stuff, because I didn't, I didn't get there on my own. Um, even though it's like, like, these guys, like, we have been, like, pushing each other for years. And um, so for me, it felt like, look, if I can do it, and, like, you know, I, I'm nowhere near the most talented guy in our group of uh, guys practicing, then all of you guys could do it. Um, you know, like, and that's kind of how I looked at it, and I still look at it like that, like, you know, I'm I'm relatively pretty, still pretty skinny and stuff like that. So if I could achieve such a ranking, like anybody else can do it, uh, if they put their mind to it, it it shows that everything's achievable. Because I, you know, I never made like a cadet team, and I I didn't make, I only made one junior team, and you know, I used to lose for years to Aaron. So <laughs> it shows it shows anything can happen. Yes. yes. Okay, now you were a part of t two Olympic teams? Uh, three. Three, okay. And in 2004, there was Podznikov, and it was the team match. And he beat you that time. And mm -hmm. so the, the American team, I think, came in fourth that year because That's right. of Podznikov. <laughs> then at the next Olympics... There you are again. Both of you are the anchors in this, you know, men's team match. And this time, you beat him. So in those four years, what was the difference between him beating you in, in the first Olympics and how were you able either physically or mentally to overcome that and be victorious in that second Olympics? Uh, it's, it's a great question, Kate. Um, so I would say um, f a couple of things. Um, first, um, you know, the first, in 2004, when we came in fourth, um, you know, it was completely my fault. Um, we were up 40 to 35, and I choked against Poznikov. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it's tough for me to still talk about that I choked, but it's important to talk about it because people need to understand it happens to everyone. Um, you know, I we, we, were, we were a great team, and uh, and the guys did everything right to give me a lead, and um, I got scared. Um, and so that's like the mental part of it. I was really scared to, like, do my actions. And, like, in terms of my actions, it's going backwards. It's using the whole strip. It's using footwork. And I, 
I remember like it was yesterday, I got on the strip and I and I was like, damn, I have to sense Poznikov, like the greatest. And and uh, and then he's and you know, I just gotta I just gotta get like five one lights and get out of here. And so I was so I was just like, let me try and go simultaneous and like just get out of here. And we could like move on with our lives and uh and that's the worst thing you can do is like just going simultaneous as a fencer because uh, that shows you have no real plan. And I, I, I didn't have a plan. I was just like a deer in headlights. So um, over, over those four years, um, you know, I took a long time off. I took a full year off because I was so depressed because I had ruined the dreams of my teammates uh, to win a medal. And uh, they had done everything right. And, um, you know, I had blown that opportunity for them. And... Um, you know, they were great in helping me get back into the sport and shows the power of our brotherhood and the, and the bond we had because, like, Tim, Jason, and Ivan really, and Yuri and Pete were the ones that really pulled me back to the sport, you know, because I was just, like, in a bad spot uh, to, like, come in fourth. It's the worst spot to finish at the Olympics. And, um, uh, and one of the things that I decided... Uh, over those four years was, um, you know, I'm going to do things a lot differently than I've done the previous four years. And part of that was, like, how I physically train. So I, I embraced um, doing more weightlifting um, and more, like, uh, like strategic, uh, like, uh, tactical drills and stuff like that, more free fencing, really working on my, like, weaknesses. And then the most important thing was working on the mental gain. Uh, and what I did with that was like just starting to be honest with like my teammates. So going to the 2008 Olympics, you know, and facing Poznikov again, I was like, "Look, man, I'm nervous, and uh, you know, like I, I don't want to blow this lead again. And I don't, well, we didn't have to lead this time. I, I don't want to like be in this situation again." And like those guys telling me like, "Hey, man, it's okay to be nervous. Like, stick with the game plan." you know, remember the game plan. And our game plan was always for me to use the whole strip and, like, and like move, move people. Like, you know, I, I, like I said before, like, I can make anybody fall short. And, I, and, and I've, I've always been able to do that for a long time. But, um, you know, in 2004, I just got scared and didn't do that. Whereas in 2008, I was like, yeah, that's my game. Like, Let's see if his attacks are better than my retreat, and they weren't, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you for your honesty about that. I can tell it, it still gets you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, but everything happens for a reason. Um, it's definitely my biggest disappointment in the sport uh, because we had, like, um, two separate occasions to win a medal, and um, and and we didn't, and we lost each by one point. Mm -hmm. So I think it, at the time somebody told me it was the first time in Olympic fencing history that, that people lost two medals oh. by one point. Oh. And I was like, That's wow. not how you want to make history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, geez, thanks. <laughs> On that note, I'd, I'd like to move away from fencing for a little bit. And you've got this whole other, this whole other side of your life that I'd like people to to hear about as well. Uh, you worked as a financial uh, analyst for Verizon while you were training for your second Olympics. Uh, how did you accomplish that and meet the demands of both? It, you know, it's a it's a good question. Um, I get that a lot actually from the Olympians, <laughs> and um, because every all of my other teammates they were essentially professional, um, ex with the exception of like Tim Morehouse, he had a, a, a job at the time. But um, what what I did was, um, um, you know, I, I was really good with time management, and I learned those time management skills in high school um, because I went to a really demanding high school, Brooklyn Tech, and. Uh, you know, I, I, and, and when I was in high school, I used to also have to take the train, the subway, uh, over one hour each way to practice. So I, I learned those skills of, like, taking this, 
riding the subway for two hours every day and uh, and then staying at practice for four hours and then coming home and doing homework all night that you know I really had to organize my time so when I when I started working at Verizon um, I didn't want to do the professional route because um, I knew just how I was mentally it would I would, I would it wouldn't work best for me personally so um I enjoyed working because it gave me a lot of balance. And I knew I wanted to do some other things in my life down the road. So essentially what I did, to answer your question succinctly, <laughs> was I, um, I, would get, I would get to work around like 7 a.m., 7.30 every day, work to about 5.30, and go to practice from 6 to 10 every night. Mm. And, uh, and then I use all of and then I would... Uh, and then I would do a double practice on Saturdays. Oh, wow. So on Saturdays, I would do like um, the Peter Westbrook Foundation take and, and also like take a lesson before the Peter Westbrook Foundation and do footwork. So basically from like 7.30 to 9, I would do that, do the foundation from 9 to 12, take a lunch break, and then do another practice from 12.30 to 3. And yeah, and then, and then Sundays um, would either be my day off or I would... Um, or we would have a competition. Mm. Um, so we would do competitions every other weekend. Uh, and so, yeah, so I just basically went back to my high school schedule of training. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually found it to be really beneficial for me, like just having that rigor and structure um, because uh, it allowed me to, like, balance, like, the pressure of, like, of training with uh, the pressure of work. So I could keep both in perspective. Wow. That made me really tired just hearing it all. That's that's an incredible amount of dedication to both aspects of life. That that's amazing. Oh, it, it was fun. <laughs> well, and now you're your own boss. You've created your own company, Physiclo. Mm -hmm. And how did you come up with? Well, first of all, tell us what your product is and how you came up with the idea. Sure. Yeah. So Physiclo is um. We integrate resistance bands and panels into activewear. So it simulates the effects of wearing ankle weights. Um, and uh, right now we offer lower body uh, resistance products. So it's you could wear either shorts, uh, three-quarter tights, or full-length tights. And, uh, and, and they simulate wearing, like, 10-pound bank weights. Um, it started as a, originally as a medical school project, and I met these med students um, who were trying to help their patients lose weight. Um, and, I, and I got the concept immediately because um, when I used to travel to Europe, primarily um, uh, Budapest and Eastern, and, like, uh, Romania and, and Poland and, and places like that, I would um, travel with resistance bands, uh, and I would use the resistance bands and wrap them around my ankles as well as around my arm and simulate fencing bouts. Hmm. So my trainer at the time had uh, created all these um, fencing-related strength activities for me to do, um, Lorenzo Gonzalez, who's a genius. So he was like, he created all these resistance band activities so you know, I can like develop a faster lunge, a stronger lunge, as well as um, develop a um, faster arm movement. Um, so once I once I came home um, and I, I um, stopped fencing, I met these med students. I was like, "Holy cow, this is genius!" And uh, and we we started working on it uh, about over three years, four years ago now. And um, we've been selling it on the market for the past two years. So it's been incredible. It's been, it's been used by thousands of fitness athletes around the world, um, professionals from the New York Knicks to Olympic fencers to, um, you know, uh, NFL players, college athletes. Because uh, it basically everyone can get, like, this boosted uh, performance and training from using it. Wow. That's that's really incredible. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me about the team, the Physiclo team. Yeah, so right, right now we have um, five, five people working on full time. Um, myself and uh, my co-founder who dropped out of med school. He, he was a biomedical engineer. Then we have like uh, a couple of guys uh, working on sales and a person 
uh, focused on marketing. Uh, and then we, we also have like uh, several like other staff members that are like in our warehouse and designers and and uh, manufacturers and but um like primarily like it's five core members uh, that do most of the heavy lifting and uh, uh you know it's a lot of work where we're you know I feel like I'm I'm starting to fence all over again because I'm having to like learn all these things like I I used to have to do with fencing like learning a new move so it, you know there's always something new to learn and. And I'm growing um, a lot from it, um, and it, and it's like fencing where you know, you know, I'm losing a lot in the first round, but I see myself uh, getting out of the first round into like the D's, and every now and then I, I win a 15-14 bout, and then I get. <laughs> what, what are these things called? Payroll taxes? What? Right, exactly. <laughs> have to pay them quarterly what exactly yeah there's so so much so many nuances to business and uh you know i've always wanted to start a business but it's something where um you know like my biggest mentor in fencing is um olympic fencer bob cottingham and he was a saber fencer and um we talked a lot about like business and life and fencing and and uh you know i'm always picking his brain i'm like man this is crazy <laughs> Well, and which do you prefer, uh, working for yourself or working for a bigger company, and why? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the media tries to romanticize, like, working for yourself as, like, the end-all, be-all. Um, it's kind of like, you know, being a professional athlete is, like, the end-all, be-all, and, you uh, you know, there's pros and cons to that as well. Uh, so I, so I, you know, I, I, I grapple with that every day. Um, I, I like the fact that, um, you know, I can say, like, I've created something that I have a lot of, like, say in the direction of it. But then there's also a lot of, like, stress involved in it. And uh, uh, it's, like I said, it's, like, very similar. Like, when I was, like, training for the Olympics, you know, every year, um, you start at zero on the point standings and like there's always the stress to maintain your ranking and this and that and I would, and you know like gosh if I you know like every now and then I would have an injury and you're just kind of like stressed out because like you're losing points and there's nothing you can do about it and uh, it's kind of the same thing with the business like you know I am like you know something can break and you're like gosh like I'm just losing uh potential customers and things like that so mm -hmm. yeah there's there's a lot of pros and cons <laughs> yeah. and uh okay i'm not going to reveal your age but do you have any plans on fencing at the veteran level uh no i do not i um i uh i <laughs> i know some of my teammates do but um you know, um, I, I like to say it very simply. Um, you know, I, I came into the sport with my sister, and we retired at the same time. So uh, unless, uh, like, they create some, like, really cool mixed veterans tournament that her and I could do together, there's no way I, I would uh, compete at the veterans level. I, you know, it's nice that we... Um, we stopped at the same time, and we have identical careers, so I think that's pretty cool. Well, you could probably find a mixed event somewhere out on the East Coast, you know, just to get competitive with each other again. Yeah, yeah, that, well, she, she would beat me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just both have to agree to fence both weapons. There you go, there we go. And then yeah. Pepe will be the grand decider. Uh, she, she's pretty good at that. She, 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 like, you know, a little known fun fact is, uh, Erin went uh, JOs in Epe, uh, and she and she entered it on a whim. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, like she's yeah, she's good. <laughs> okay, then maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe if it's like single sticks, like bring it back to the 1904 Olympics, oh. like I could beat her. Oh, there you go. Yeah, uh, I could beat her in something like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're drawing to the end of our time together, but I'd like to finish up this interview with a mixture of famous questions from James Lipton, who does Inside the Actor's Studio, 
and Marcel Proust, who came up with the original list. Mm. So here we go. What is your favorite word? Cool. <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Ooh, um, geez, probably hate. Mm. What sound or noise do you love? I love the sound of um, waves crashing on beach. Hmm. And what sound or noise do you, I'll have to use that word, hate? <laughs> uh, you know, I definitely hate uh, the sound of anybody in like real pain or agony. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's always hard to hear. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Ooh, uh, I, I definitely have uh, dreams of like maybe getting into like politics in a couple of decades. Seems really interesting. Um, yeah, that might be cool. <laughs> what profession would you not like to do? Ooh, uh, whew. I think, um, you know, I've had some bad jobs over the years, so uh, <laughs> uh, the, the easiest one I, I would say is uh, like being like a banana picker. I dislike to smell bananas. <laughs> well, and there are tarantulas in those things, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and my family's from Jamaica, so I've seen like banana pickers, and I'm like, uh, that doesn't look fun. <laughs> yeah, hot, humid. <laughs> Spiders, no. Exactly. Where would you like to live? Uh, I, well, I, I love New York and probably a second residence in L.A. What do you value most in your friends? Honesty. Who is your hero? My parents. What is your motto? Uh to never stop believing and be happy. Could you share the, uh, the website of your, of your company so that people can go visit it if they're interested in learning more about you or the, the tights that you've created? Sure, yeah. The website is physical, and it's um, P-H-Y-S-I-C-L-O dot com, or you can follow us on social media at G at get physical G E T P H Y S I C L O. All right, thank you so much again, Keith, for agreeing to to uh, tolerate my questions and <laughs> give me honest answers. <laughs> the pleasure was all mine. It was a true uh, joy and a lot of fun. Well, I hope to see you around sometime, and uh, I wish you all the best with your with your company and the uh, amazing product that you've come up with. Well, thank you very much. And it's just, I love talking fences. Uh, happy to chat anytime, whether online or off. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. <laughs> thank you. Same to you. Cheers. Bye. Visit www.physiclo.com to see product reviews as well as all of the products that Keith's company sells. Thank you once again to Tony Esqueda, who does the editing for this podcast, and to my husband, David Sierra, who provided the logo, and also lots of support for this crazy project of mine. Thank you to all my listeners out there who have been so faithful in supporting me and to regularly listening to these interviews. And thank you to my sponsor, Cutting Edge Fencing, that allowed me to purchase the patches pins and stickers for the Saber Coach Kate podcast swag. Tune in next week to hear my interview with Andrew Fischel, otherwise known as Cyrus of Chaos. You might know him from his YouTube channel. He was one of the first people to provide regular updates to Saber videos from international events. 